Everybody, welcome back to The Reason We Learn. I'm Deb Philman, mom, homeschooler, educator. Happy Valentine's Day. Today I want to talk to you about an author who is very near and dear to my heart, and that is Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel. His birthday is coming up, actually. And you may see um, all over the internet claims that he was a racist. He was a terrible racist, and therefore we shouldn't be reading his books. This is kind of right up there with George Washington was a racist, this one's a racist, that one's a racist. I mean, everybody's a racist because of some view they held or something they did in the past. And in the case of Dr. Seuss, I find it especially egregious and especially coming from people who in the same breath that they would call Dr. Seuss a racist and say we should basically cancel him and not read his books and read a bunch of books instead as opposed to just intermingle his books with other books or teach his books in context and explain why things were the way they were and what they really they mean or they don't really mean. Um, these same people will turn on and tell you that instead of having police in a very violent school where there are regularly stabbings, shootings, beatings, fights, rapes, etc., that we should have something called restorative justice. And that rather than put teenagers in prison, we should engage in restorative justice. That we should understand that people make mistakes and they change and they can grow and if they just need to learn and need to be exposed to the right way to do things, etc. Restorative justice is a big topic and it's a big thing that you will hear from some of the people today talking about anti-racism, etc., is that we need to go to a different model of policing and have social workers and restorative justice experts working with people because people make mistakes. They don't always do the right thing at first and they need to be, you know, educated, etc., to the right thing. Interestingly enough, when they look back on the past, um, they are not concerned at all about restorative justice. They're not remotely concerned with the idea that someone could change, could be redeemed, or in fact did change and was redeemed in their lifetime. Not just that they, we should look upon them more kindly because in the context of when they lived, they were taught di different things and exposed to different things and had different kinds of stresses than we have, but they completely ignore progress that these individual people make. make. And we even see it today where people go and apologize or they show that, yes, 20 years ago I did something, but then obviously I changed my mind. Nope, it doesn't matter. You once did a bad thing, forget it. You're always tarnished. You are forever stained. And if you notice, the people who are allowed no restorative justice, no, no redemption whatsoever are consistently white consistently they are white. Every so often they might be Asian, but only if they're super successful. But they're consistently white and a disproportionate amount of time they're also white and Jewish. But I digress. In the case of Dr. Seuss, this person, somebody named Megan at Teach for Change, is all over Dr. Seuss and how racist he was. Let's take a look at her evidence for how racist he was. I think almost every American adult in my life has some attachment to Dr. Seuss and his classics like The Cat in the Hat and Green Eggs and Ham. Now these very same adults are exposing their children and grandchildren to these books, <gasps> passing beloved stories down to our children in some way allows grown-ups to hold on to their childhood memories just a little bit longer and also help our kids learn to read with very easy to read books that are memorable and therefore easy for children to memorize and read back to themselves. But never mind that. We don't really want kids to be literate. We just want them to be indoctrinated into the right way to think. Anyway, where was I? Dr. Seuss books still have a pretty comfortable seat on the best-selling list of children's books with good reason. You'll find these books in almost every early childhood classroom across the country because they're witty. They support early readers. Yes, they do. With text is full of rhyme and repetition and they take the reader on imaginative journeys. Yes, they do. Well, here's the shattering truth. Are you ready? It's shattering. Are you ready to be shattered? Dr. Seuss was a racist. No, he wasn't. But okay, she's alleging he was a racist. Let's see what her proof is. Here's why, why it matters, and what you can do about it. Well, I hate to break it to you. He's dead. So there's nothing you can do about it if you believe it, if you buy this evidence. Before his career as a children's author where he was known as Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel's early works were laden with racist language and illustrations. Why was that? I wonder if there was a reason. Well, anyway, let's continue and we'll look into that. He targeted racial and ethnic. He did? He he personally targeted. Okay. Ethnic minority groups in his cartoons and advertisements depicting Jewish people, Muslims, Arabs, Japanese, indigenous people, and black people using racist stereotypes and in exoticized ways. For example, black people are often portrayed as monkeys in his work accompanied by captions using the N-word. Okay, now here's something that she's done. She's conflated Japanese, first of all, and you know, with all of these other things. She's conflated using stereotypes, stereotypes with, you know, ethnic slurs and things like that. And she's given you no context as to when this occurred, 
what year we're talking about, what else was going on at the time, what, what was his purpose, why was he doing this? Did he just wake up one day and said, I'm going to draw children's books so that they can hate these people because I don't like them and I'm a racist? Or was there maybe some purpose behind it? We're not told any of that. Now, as far as stereotypes go, again, the year might make a difference. Not excusing it by today's standards, simply saying that the time period might influence this. Okay? Anyway. These racist attitudes were carried through to his children's books. In, tw in 2019, The Conscious Kid published a study where they analyzed 50 of the 59 Dr. Seuss books through the lens of anti-blackness, white supremacy, and Orientalism. Of the 2,240 human characters that were depicted in his books, only 2% represented POC, BIPOC characters are basically obsolete from Dr. Seuss books, and as few inclusions of these characters promote racism and white supremacy. Mm, do they? Really? Or are you maybe stretching the definition like everyone of the woke does today? The examples that I found to be the most disturbing are from I Ran If I Ran the Zoo, where we meet the only two characters out of the 2,240 characters in Dr. Seuss books who are African and or black. These characters are portrayed as monkeys and the representation leans into exotification and stereotypes. Within the same book, Asian characters are depicted as subservient as they carry a white male who is holding a gun on top of their heads. The Texans page read, helpers who all wear their eyes at a slant, and continues to the next page, I'll catch him in countries that no one can spell. Even the non-human characters in Dr. Seuss books are racialized. The infamous icon, the black cat of the cat in the hat, was inspired by a black woman who operated the elevator, the publishing, like kids are gonna frigging know this. This is... So the character was inspired by a woman he knew, but the kids are knowing this and that. I mean, it's a cat. To 99.99999% of children reading this, it is a cat. And they are not seeing black women in it, but okay. This isn't surprising given the early in, early in his career, Dr. Seuss wrote and performed in his own minstrel show, Chicopee Surprise. Do you have any idea what year that was, madam? No, you don't. The Sneetches is often used to teach concepts of anti-racism and discrimination to young children and is promoted on several social justice platforms. The oppressed group, Plain Belly Sneetches, are portrayed as moping in their sadness that they expand, expend all their resources and efforts to try to become like the dominant group, Star Belly Sneetches. However, as the study says, this is a problematic, misguided way of perceiving oppressed groups. Oppressed communities are generally fighting to hang on to their own culture and identity and not have it colonized, erased, marginalized. And er no, that's your interpretation of what oppressed communities are trying to do. It may be true, but it also may be true that they're simply trying to be accepted while keeping their culture. It's a two-sided two thing here. Yes, I want to keep my culture and not be assimilated completely and have to give up, give it up. But at the same time, I would like to be, when I do venture into your culture, I would like to be treated, you know, a, a, as you find me and not judged just on the basis of things I can't help. So it's a little more complicated than that. But let's definitely distill it down to this oversimplified vision version of things. Oppressed people want to be free of oppression. They don't want to be their oppressor. Really? Maybe you should go have a little chat with uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones and Ibram X. Kendi because I'm pretty sure they would disagree with you. That's exactly what they want to do is tell everybody else what to be. That's why people are problematized like you're doing right now to Dr. Seuss. But to people today who are alive today, that's why you decide to cancel them and they're, they're, they are shunned. That's why you declare that an entire race of people are automatically racist because of the color of their skin. That is exactly why people are told, don't you dare tone police me. When all you're asking for is civility and politeness. Oh, but see, politeness is white and you're allowed to be rude. There's a certain kind of privilege. You can be rude if you're not white. But if you're white, you don't you don't you dare. Don't you dare ask for politeness from somebody or civility or don't you dare even, you know, criticize somebody or say that they're being nasty. Then you're tone policing or you're judging or you're being so white. You're being oppressive. Really? Or is it more oppressive to tell people what they are? And not let them say, no, I don't feel that way. Oh, well, that's just your racism talking. You're just, that's just proof. You're so fragile. But please tell me more how you don't want to be the oppressor. This is just a small sample of some of the problematic, oh, there's that word, aspects of Theodore Geisel's work and Dr. Seuss books. I highly encourage you to read the whole study here. Okay. Well, some argue that children would not understand these deeper interpretations because they wouldn't due to the whimsical nature of his stories. And that's, that's just not true. After reading this study, I pulled out the extensive collection I have in my home and reread them with a critical lens. You're an adult. You're an adult. And you've read a study. And you're going to read the books. And you're telling us what children are going to think. <laughs> the messages that children absorb through literature will impact their racial beliefs. No, they won't. Because they live in the world. And when you read a book to them, especially if it's being read by someone with a non-racist sensibility, they're not going to derive that from it. In fact, the opposite. 
that you can read literature to someone and say, well, this man was writing in the 1940s and this was a long time ago and we don't talk about people that way anymore, but it's a funny story besides that. That's this one aspect of it. Or otherwise, we'd never read Huck Finn. We would never read Tom Sawyer. We would never read uh, so many things that are still valuable to read that have value as early readers, et cetera, for all children, for all children. I was a Jewish child. My children were, you know, they didn't see this at all. I can assure you some of their favorite books are Dr. Seuss. Oh, tell me how the foot book is racist. D tell me how a the ABC book is racist. Tell me how you're talking about all of these characters, over 2000 characters. You're talking about so many books. Tell me how the Lorax is racist. Jesus. There's no reason to continue promoting his books. Okay, well, let's have a look at what the Art of Dr. Seuss collection actually has to say about it, okay? Because they're, they're wise to this. They know what's going on. Let's see what it says. Theodore Seuss Geisel, a.k.a. Dr. Seuss, created thousands of cartoons, illustrations, paintings, sculptures, and stories over the course of his 70-year career. While the vast majority of the works he produced are positive and inspiring, Ted Geisel also drew a handful of early images which are disturbing. These racially stereotyped drawings were hurtful then and are still hurtful today. However, Ted's cartoons and books also reflect his evolution. There's that word, evolution. Evolution. You do believe in it, right? Right? You believe in it? Okay. I mean, we follow the science, don't we? Okay. Just checking. Later works such as The Sneetches or Horton Hears a Who emphasize inclusion and acceptance. Ted would later edit some of his inappropriate images depicting his characters in a more respectful manner. Guess you don't have those versions of you or you're just ignoring that they exist. Born in 1904. 1904. I'm sure that has no relevance at all. No, couldn't possibly be relevant whatsoever to this man's life. Ted Gazel grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. Well before any of his iconic books were written, he embraced the Dr. Seuss moniker, making his living in New York City, 1927 to 1941. Again, I'm sure no, no context whatsoever to what, you know, the zeitgeist was. Writing and cartooning for several popular magazines, Judge, Look, The Saturday Evening Post, New York Woman, Stage, and Vanity Fair. His famous flit advertisements for Standard Oil were carried in newspapers around the country, making him a prince celebrity. Yet while everyone recognized the name Dr. Seuss, few actually could pick out the man Ted Geisel. Stunned by the Great Depression and the onset of war in Europe in January 1941, Dr. Seuss joined ranks with a bunch of cockeyed crusaders at PM Magazine, producing three or more cartoons a week, sailing the Axis powers, and finding himself a staunch supporter of President Roosevelt, who felt America's entry into the war was inevitable. PM was against people who pushed other people around, Ted said. I liked that. He was against people who pushed other people around, against Nazis and against Tojo Japan. Okay, those are the ideologies. And my father was 10 years old when the war started. And he told me that even he as a child was taught some pretty negative things about the Japanese. In fact, they called them the Japs. And looking back on it, he says it was terrible what we were taught to believe. But at the same time, it was felt at the time that in order to have people feel like it was okay that they were giving up their husbands and their sons and their fathers to go off and possibly die in this war, they had to demonize the enemy. I don't agree with it anymore. Than expert. I hate war. I'm anti-war. Okay. But this was a situation that was foisted on us. We were attacked. We, the United States of America, were attacked by the Japanese and Germany declared war on the United States. So do you want to sit there and say, you know, oh, they're really wonderful, amazing people that attacked us? Or do you say to children like, yeah, they're bad people? It's, it's terrible, but we're a lot more evolved now. In the 1940s, it was very different. In the late 1930s, very different. Completely different mindset than it is now. I'm not excusing it. I'm explaining it. And there's a difference. And you can explain things, even to young children. You want to talk about, oh, they see all the subtext? Well, guess what? If you think they're smart enough to see the subtext, they're smart enough to hear a nuanced explanation for why the, the characters in If I Ran the Zoo look the way they do. And that's only if they ask, by the way. If they don't notice it, they don't freaking notice because they're growing up in a different culture and they probably won't because they're not used to these kinds of depictions and they're not looking for negativity in every last little thing until you tell them to. When you tell them to, they will find it. Maybe don't do that. Because his intention at the time was not to do that. He was just going with what was the, the commonly, you know, uh, um, understood way to do things. And also what was marketable. He was selling his books. So I'm not saying, again, that it's good. It's just that there's context. So he says, still, it was not enough for Ted. On January 7th, 1943, Captain Theodore Seuss Geisel was inducted into the Army, assigned to the Information and Education Division. Within a few weeks, he joined Frank Capper's unit at Fort Fox. As a creative, he wasn't alone in making the sacrifice. Historian Paul Horgan, screenwriter Leonard Sp Sp 
Spiegel Gas, composer Meredith Wilson, novelist Irving Wallace, and illustrator P.D. Eastman worked with him alongside the civilian animators. Chuck Jones and Fritz Freeling, Warner Brothers, uh, those uh, animators. Ted mustered out on January 13th, 1946, as Lieutenant Colonel, same as my grandfather when he got out, receiving the Legion of Merit for exceptionally meritorious service in planning, producing films, particularly those utilizing animated cartoons for training, informing, and enhancing the morale of troops. These troops had to go and do horrible things and endure horrible things. And if you read anything about World War II, you will know how the Japanese soldiers treated our soldiers. Tragically, one way to keep the morale up was to depict the enemy in very unflattering terms. And he did as ordered. Does that make him a racist across the board? No, it does not. Does it make what was happening good? No. We were in the middle of a war. There was a whole lot of bad to go around. A whole lot of bad to go around on all sides. When Ted first began to write for children in 1937, many representations of people of color in the media were unfortunately depicted through racial stereotypes. In his first book, and to think uh, that I saw it on Mulberry Street, his work was no exception. For example, to represent a lone Asian character, Ted employed traditional clothing and chopsticks to depict his ethnicity. He originally referred to this character as a Chinaman and showed his skin color as yellow. It is important to note that in a later reprint, he removed the color and changed the text to a Chinese man. Geisel's great nephew, Ted Owens, recalled his uncle's decision to make the change. It was the first time he had changed one of his books, Art and Humanity Are Always Evolving. Mulberry Street was written in 1937. By contrast, the much-beloved The Sneetches was written in 1961, just as the civil rights movement was well underway. Ted wrote The Sneetches as a parable about equality. By drawing bird beings, he transcended the boundaries and pitfalls of using humans as characters and allowed all readers to re relate to the characters as best they could. On March 2nd, 2016, President Obama agreed with Dr. Seuss. President Obama! Just gonna let that sink in. Telling a group of interns pretty much all the stuff you need to know is in Dr. Seuss, it's like star belly snitches, you know? We're all the same. So why would we treat somebody differently just because they don't have a star on their belly? Maybe, maybe Ms. Meredith might want to read up on that. Justice is not always about canceling someone in their body of work. Sometimes it looks like providing room for restorative justice to take place, writes Daniel Slaughter from um, Mamademics. Uh, Mamademics. In my opinion, Dr. Seuss using the, remain using the remainder of his career to focus on writing books full of important lessons is an example of restorative justice. Boom. And I agree. Slaughter also notes that three of Dr. Seuss's most well-known later works, Horton Hears a Who, The Lorax, and The Sneetches, teach about the importance of inclusion and acceptance of others and yourself. In his book, Becoming... Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel, and the Making of an American Imagination, biographer Brian J. Jones says that Dr. Seuss drew some racist stereotypes in his early work. Jones told the San Diego Union Tribune, as I say in the book, it's not a great look for him, but he evolves. By the end of 1950s, Geisel has written Horton Hears a Who, who which is dedicated to a Japanese friend and is seen by scholars now as an apology for the earlier cartoons. He'd written Yertle the Turtle, an anti-fascist send-up of Hitler, and he'd penned a magazine story that would become the anti-discrimination book, The Sneetches. I don't think you write a book like The Sneetches if you haven't evolved, Jones said. Dr. Seuss' later works show an evolution of values and beliefs. Those who knew him believe that he were alive today, he would have jumped at the chance to be part of the country's evolving dialogue about diversity inclusion i have no doubt and yet and yet back in 2017 his great nephew had to be confronted with the fact that a museum mural was completely removed it was completely removed because it was at the D amazing world of dr seuss museum so presumably if you're going there you're going there to look at the at the stuff and um uh let's see yep he changed they talk about the changing of the book and so forth, but I think this person is completely. <sighs> You're going to see this a lot. You're going to see this a lot more because it's part of the cancel culture. You're going to see people, it's just like, nope, we have to stop using this. They're trying to get rid of classics. They're trying to get rid of so much of the past. And as I said, it is not about this. This woman doesn't really care whether Dr. Seuss was racist or he wasn't racist. She wants you to not read these books. She wants you to replace his work with other work, presumably written by people that she likes better. Look, look, crisscrossing things out. Crisscrossing things out. Don't read this. Don't read this. And all of these books. And notice they're all images of children of color. How is this not just the reverse? How is this not the reverse? And isn't it a little bit stereotypical isn't this saying that it's a monolith and, you know, all people of color have, you know, their hair like this? All people, you know, all the people who, you know, who would not want to read Dr. Seuss look like this? So what do I tell my child who's white? I'm looking, this, I'm not seeing any, this is better? This isn't better. 
This isn't better. Dr. Seuss Book of Colors, we cross it out. The ABC book, we cross it out. Why? Why can't, if, if you're inclusive, then you include. If you want your child to read books with kids that look like you, go for it. I didn't feel left out because I was reading books to my child about the ABCs that had almost no people. Never mind ones that were white. I don't choose the books based on whether the people in them look like me. Okay? I don't. Um, the, the book about um, the little boy in the snow. Gosh, what was that book? About that little boy who went outside, um, whistles, uh, Whistle for Willie. Love that book. I love the book as a child. I read the book to my children. It's about a little black boy. Okay. Didn't look at it and go, oh, but he's black. So it's about, you know, it's about like black something privilege, but no, it just, it's a book about a little boy and it's a good book. It's excellent literature with fantastic illustrations and a great story. And you read it to your child because of that, because it's good, not because of what the character looks like. And this bothers me so much because this, they'll say, oh, it's about inclusion. No, it isn't. This is not inclusion. This is exclusion. Fox in socks is a problem now. If you want to teach Fox and Socks, teach little ones. It's like we can't just point out to you that there are some books that may be, you know, that may need some contextualizing for children. Like I, if I ran the zoo or if I saw it on Mulberry Street, that you might do to, need to explain the historical context in which it was written. Or maybe you'll find a better book than that and don't read that book specifically. But there's nothing wrong with these other books. Nothing. Zero. We don't cancel the person. We don't throw out the entire body of their work because they went through an evolution and you don't like that they didn't start there. Because again, if that's your point of view, then let's put the cops right back in the schools. Let's put them right back in there because, you know, I'm sorry, hon. You beat someone up. No retribution for you. No, nope, no restorative justice for you. You made a bad choice. You, somebody says something racist in school against white people. Oh, sorry. No restorative justice for you. You're out. Get out. So, but it doesn't work that way, does it? Only works in one direction, does it? No, all the restorative justice in the world, nobody goes to jail. No, we get, we're going to have little 11 and 12 year old murderers who are going to just go to juvie and be out in you know, a year or two with a slap on the wrist because they killed somebody. But that's okay because you know they're going to change. They're going to evolve. That's fine. No, no problem. But this man was born in 1904. He went through the depression. He voluntarily went into the army to help us win a war against actual fascists. And now you want to be a fascist. Nope. Don't read this. Don't read that. It's problematic. Don't do this because we don't have brains enough to like comprehend what was going on at the time and got to write him off. Oh, nope. He's a bad guy. Bull. Sorry. So here's me telling you, go out today. And if you have a grandchild or a child or you want to just donate a book to somebody who might appreciate it. Go buy yourself a Dr. Seuss book and give it to a kid. You know what? Do the star-bellied sneeches. Do it for me. Do it for him. Do it for restorative justice. Do it for the concept of evolution. Do it to fight cancel culture because this is some BS right here. Anyway, if you appreciate this sort of content and you love Dr. Seuss as I do, I hope you will subscribe to this channel and like this video, comment this video, share this video. That's the video.